you have your personal copy of God's Word, please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. The chapter is 1, and we're going to take a look at verses 6 through 11. Acts, the chapter is 1, and the verses are 6 through 11. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. It is from this passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, Lift Jesus Lift Jesus up. The ascension of Jesus is one event that proves the inevitable result of a life well lived. It is a story of both vindication and exaltation. The Christian is finally vindicated by their removal from a sinful world and also at the same time exalted by God himself to be in glory forevermore. The ascension of Jesus is recorded for us in two gospel accounts and was included in the message of hope given to Christians during the first century. Mark records the ascension in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, where the Bible reads, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Luke also records the ascension in his own gospel account, as we see in Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 53, where the Bible reads, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Not only do these two gospel accounts record the ascension like the book of Acts does, but we see also that within these gospel accounts, Jesus himself spoke of his ascension in plain language to his apostles, beginning with John chapter 16, verse 28, where the Bible reads, Jesus says, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shared these same words with Mary Magdalene after his resurrection in John chapter 20 and the verse is 17 where Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God 
and your God. When we speak of the ascension, my brothers and sisters, we are talking about Jesus returning to the Father after his crucifixion and resurrection. The ascension was foretold by the psalmist in Psalm 68, verse 18, where the Bible reads, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. And the reason why we know Psalm 68, verse 18, speaks of the ascension is because Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, suggests as much. Listen to your Bible. In Ephesians chapter 4, and the verses are 8 through 10. Ephesians chapter 4, and the verses are 8 through 10. The Bible reads, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also had descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended where? Far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. This ascension, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, occurred 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53, that this event prompted great joy among the first Christians. For this reason, the ascension was preached and must continue to be preached to the brethren. Listen to your Bible. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56, Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56, the Bible reads, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. We fast forward to Romans chapter 8, verse 34, where the Bible reads, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is presently interceding for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, Verses 19 through 21, the Bible reads, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and not only that, but seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible reads, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Then we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where they talk about the mystery of godliness. The Bible tells us, as the Apostle Paul shares with the young preacher Timothy, by saying, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, how Jesus was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and then he speaks of the ascension by saying, taken up in glory. Then we look at the words of the Hebrew writer in which he dedicates this book of Hebrews, not only in speaking about the superiority of Jesus over Moses, not only talking about how the new covenant is more excellent than the old covenant, but he spends a great detail, he spends a great 
deal of time, if you will, speaking about the ascension of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1, and the verses are 3 and 4, the Bible reads, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Then we look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, where the Bible reads, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Hebrews chapter 8, and the verse, verses are 1 and 2. The Bible reads, now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest who is seated, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord sets up, not man. Then we take a look at Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. The Bible reads, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. And then we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and as a result is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then a very familiar passage of Scripture. We quote the first half of it, but we don't place as much emphasis on the second half of it as many of the other Scriptures do, and that's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. In 1 Peter chapter 3, Verse 21 and 22, the Bible reads, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. The Bible tells us, as we look at the story of the ascension in Acts chapter 1, that two men in white robes, who we believe to be angels, appeared by the 11 apostles at the time of the ascension and assured these 11 men that Jesus will return in the same way as he ascended into heaven. Yet all that has been spoken by way of inspiration, there appears to me to be no greater verse than the words spoken by the Savior, Jesus Christ himself, regarding his own ascension. Jesus spoke these words to the Pharisee and the teacher of Israel, a man by the name of Nicodemus. Hear the dialogue in John chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. John chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. The Bible reads, Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I tell you, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe 
if I tell you heavenly things. No one has, get this now, ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Yes, we understand that Jesus was lifted up on the cross by God's plan according to John chapter 12 verse 32. Yes, he was lifted up from the Hadean world by God's promise according to Acts chapter 2 verse 27. Yes, Jesus was lifted up from Joseph's new tomb by God's power in Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 7. Yes, he was lifted up from the earth by God's purpose according to Acts chapter 1 verse 9. But now by God's presence, we who claim the name of Jesus Christ are tasked to lift up Jesus and hold him up so that all men may be drawn unto him. And I stopped by this afternoon just to let you know that the story of the ascension in the book of Acts shows us how this work of lifting Jesus up is to be accomplished by us on today. There's six points that I want to bring to your attention, six brief points, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 6. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible reads, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The first way that we lift Jesus up is when we come together. When we come together, we are lifting Jesus up. This is speaking of worship. I just don't understand how individuals cannot worship and yet claim that they're lifting up the name of Jesus, that they're lifting him up high so that the world can see. Well, how can the world see Jesus if you refuse to be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? The way we lift Jesus up is by coming together. Because when we come together, we engage in something called the Lord's Supper. And Jesus says, you do this until I come again. You show forth my death by doing this. And so when we come together to worship God in spirit and in truth, that is the obvious, the easiest, and the first way by which we lift up Jesus. How do we expect people to come to Jesus if people who say they love Jesus don't even honor Jesus or serve Jesus and so when we come together we lift Jesus up not only that look at verse 7 and verse 7 the Bible reads he said to them it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority the second way we lift up Jesus is when we take God at his word notice that in this text the apostles asked Jesus a question and Jesus in essence responded by saying that's none of your business Jesus said it is not for you to know the time it's not for you to know the season and so that means that we lift Jesus up when we have faith that means we take God at his word we don't have to know all the answers to our questions we just have to do the answers that we have already received by the commandments of Christ and so the question is will you still trust him even when he doesn't tell you everything you want to know that's how we lift up Jesus people may have questions God doesn't give answers but the answer you do have is that there's a God will you still take him at his word? The fact that Jesus died on the cross, we know that. Will you still serve Jesus if this same Jesus doesn't answer your questions like he didn't answer the apostles' questions? 
The apostles still went out and did what they were told, even though they never got an answer to this question. Why? Because they trust Jesus, and that's how we lift him up, by trusting him. Even when we got questions and he refuses to answer. That brings us to verse number eight. Not only must we worship and have faith, but look at verse 8. In verse 8, the Bible reads, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. My brothers and sisters, we lift up Jesus when we serve as his witnesses. We lift up Jesus when we serve as his witnesses. This is speaking of evangelism. One of the ways that we are able to lift up Jesus is by being a witness of how good Jesus is. We see it in the text. There are a lot of people that will not revangelize. They refuse to evangelize. If you refuse to evangelize, then at the same time, you have refused to lift Jesus up, and there's no way around that. Oh, I lift Jesus up. I just don't tell anybody about him. Oh, I lift Jesus up. I just don't serve as one of his witnesses. Oh, I lift Jesus up. I, I just, it's just not within my comfort zone to talk to other people about this Jesus. Well, if you're not, lifting, if you're not witnessing about Jesus, you are not lifting him up. Because the opposite of witnessing is to be ashamed of the one you're supposed to be witnessing about. Now, granted, I get it. In this text, they're talking about eyewitnesses. These 11 men walked with Jesus. They saw his miracles with their own eyes. They saw him heal people with their own eyes. They saw him raise the dead back to life with their own eyes. They saw him die with their own eyes. They saw him buried with their own eyes. They went to the tomb and the tomb was empty. They saw that with their own eyes. They saw Jesus walking among them for 40 days. They were talking with him with their own eyes. And with their own eyes, they saw Jesus ascend into heaven. And so they were to go out and they were to tell that story. Now, yes, none of us have seen that. If you have, then please don't tell me what you're smoking or what you're drinking. Don't tell me your age, because I know that you have to at least be 1,950 years old to even have come close to witnessing, eyewitnessing those things. But what can we witness about? We can witness about how we used to be lost, but now we saved, and the difference was Jesus. We can talk about how we were down, but now we're up, and the reason is Jesus. We could talk about how we were going in the wrong direction, but someone stopped us, turned us around, and pointed us in the right direction, and that person was Jesus. We could talk about how we was down, but he picked us up. That person was Jesus. That's what we witness. We can witness what we read. We can witness our, uh, our transformation. We can witness the change within us. And that's the story we can tell because of Jesus. And whenever we go throughout this world, wherever we go, and people ask us, why are you smiling? Why are you happy? Why are you up? Why are you encouraged where everything around you is falling apart? We should be able to lift Jesus up in that moment and say, if it had not been for the Lord by my side. I don't know where I would be. That's what it means to be a witness. And so when we lit witness about Jesus, we are lifting him up. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, the Bible says, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. We lift Jesus up when we acknowledge his ascension. We lift Jesus up when we acknowledge his ascension. Stephen acknowledged the ascension of Jesus. Paul acknowledged the ascension 
of Jesus. The Hebrew writer acknowledged the ascension of Jesus. Peter acknowledged the ascension of Jesus. What were they doing when they acknowledged the ascension of Jesus? When they told people that Jesus was lifted up, they were actually at the same time lifting up Jesus. Because that's what causes us to live the way we live, to do the things we do, knowing that our Savior is not dead. We serve a risen Savior who is in heaven reigning right now, interceding for us right now. And whenever we tell that story, we are giving hope to those that we're talking to, and when we hear it ourselves, we are injecting hope within us, knowing that if Jesus died and God not only raised him from the grave, but raised him from the earth, if I just simply follow in the footsteps of Jesus, his end becomes my end. And that's something to be hopeful for. This world will beat you down. Why make decisions to stay down? Just lift up Jesus, and Jesus will lift you up. I used to run track, and one of the things they used to try to get us to do is not get so wrapped up in your events. So if you were uh, a shot putter, they would make you try out pole vault. And if you were a hurdler, they will make you run the two mile. If you were a sprinter, they will put you, uh, make you a long jump. They just tried to get you to do other things because yes, there may be an event that you are good at. There may be an event that you are comfortable at. There may be an event that you uh, prefer to do. There may be events that you choose not to do, but you don't know how good you are unless you try everything. And so little old me, they tried to get me to do triple jump and long jump. And one of the things they taught you when it came to long jumping is the fact that once you hit that line and you jump, don't look down. Look up. Because your body will go in the direction that your eyes are going. So if I jump and I do like this, my trajectory goes down. But if I jump and I do this, then my trajectory goes up. And so the reason why we have to acknowledge the ascension is because for as long as we are looking up, then that is our trajectory. But if we look down, then tell Satan how because that's where you're going to end up. So look to Jesus. Look up. Look to where you're trying to go. That's where hope is. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, the Bible reads, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. This is what this text has to do with lifting Jesus up. We, look, we lift Jesus up when we look to heaven. That's different than acknowledging the ascension. That's simply stating a fact, telling somebody about the fact, believing the fact yourself. But here in this text, we see them looking up into heaven. By this, what they're doing is engaging in guidance. Guidance. We lift Jesus up when we look to heaven for guidance. Notice the scene here. Jesus had spent three and a half years teaching these men. So they know what to do. Jesus spent three and a half years telling them that that moment was going to happen. Jesus spent the last 40 days talking to them about the kingdom of God. Yet, when Jesus ascended, after they had even received the orders to go to Jerusalem, they don't head to Jerusalem right away. They look to heaven. 
And don't you know that whenever we look to heaven for guidance, God provides that guidance. And God at that moment provided guidance to the apostles in the form of two angels, messengers, to let them know that, yes, this happened. Yes, what Jesus told you to do, you must do. Yes, he left, but he's coming back again, just like he said he would. So now, go get to work. And after these men confirmed what Jesus had already said, what did the apostles do? They went on to Jerusalem. And sometimes, no matter how well we, we know the Bible, no matter how long we've been studying, no matter how long we have been members of the church, God is still in the business of providing guidance. One of the worst things we can do is when a situation arises, we say, oh, I already know what to do. I've already read the solution to the problem. I've already addressed that before, so I'm going to do it the same way. No, you need to look to the book for guidance. This is what Moses did even in the Old Testament. Moses came down from the mountain with Ten Commandments. God says, if you don't keep these commandments, you shall die. He made that clear. One of those commandments is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Moses comes down the mountain, gives these commandments, read these commandments. Everybody know what they're going to do. But then one Saturday morning, a man walks outside and decides to do yard work. Started picking up sticks on the Sabbath broke the fourth commandment. Moses didn't immediately kill the man, even though he knew what the law said. He paused, dropped to his knees and prayed, and went to God and sought God for guidance, and God came back that what Moses knew to do was the right thing to do, and that man was cut off from the people. But that work was blessed because somebody looked up to heaven seeking some guidance. Yes, I know what a person must do in order to be saved. But you still pray before you teach somebody. You still pray after you've taught somebody. You still pray when somebody wants to come to Christ. You still pray after that person has submitted to the gospel call. You still pray after that person has responded to the gospel. You still pray as you go through your life each and every day. You have to always look up for guidance. That's what the ascension teaches us. And as we close, look at verse number 11. The book said and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. We lift Jesus up when we prepare for his return. What does that mean? That means that we from this day forward must live a godly life. We must engage in godly life living. That's how we lift Jesus up. When we don't do the things we used to do. When we think the right thoughts. When we think holy thoughts. When we speak holy words. When we do holy works. When we engage in holy deeds. When we consecrate ourselves. When we live for Jesus. When we live up to the name saint. When we live up to the name Christian. When we live up to the name child of God. When we walk, talk, and live like we are children of the king. We are lifting up Jesus when we prepare for his return. And so I want to close by giving you the words of that old hymnal in regards to lifting up Jesus. How to reach the masses. Men of every birth, for an answer, Jesus gave a key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The world is hungry for the living bread. Lift the Savior up for them to see. Trust him and do not doubt the words that he said. I'll draw all men unto me. Don't exalt the preacher. Don't exalt the pew. Preach the gospel, simple, full, and free. Prove him, that's test him, and you will find that the promise is true, and he will draw all men unto him. Lift him up.
by living as a Christian ought. Let the world in you the Savior see. Then men will gladly follow him who once taught, I will draw all men unto me. So lift him up. Lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. If we just lift him up, that's our job. The drawing is Jesus' job. But Jesus can't do his job until we do our job first. That means we got to worship first. We have to have faith first. We have to evangelize first. We have to have hope first. We have to seek guidance first. And we have to live holy first. And when we do that, lifting up Jesus in that way, then trust me when Jesus says, all men will be drawn unto him. You want to grow a church? Lift up Jesus. You want people to be saved? Lift up Jesus. You want people at your job to act differently? Lift up Jesus. You want your family saved? Lift up Jesus. That's all we have to do. It's that simple. Jesus gave the key. The question is, will we use that key to open the door so that people can enter into his kingdom? Thank you so much for your time and attention. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one because we have lifted up Jesus today. Then you need to stop fighting his drawing power. Come to him. Believe in him. Give up sin. Confess Christ. Be baptized. Have your sins washed away. And become a creature that will lift up Jesus. And if you are a Christian and you haven't been lifting him up, now is the opportunity to prepare for his return, to look to heaven, to acknowledge his ascension, to be a witness for him, to take God at his word and to worship him faithfully so that God, through Jesus Christ, can draw all men unto him. You just repent and do what he has told you to do, and that is lift up Jesus. Lift him up right here, right now, while we stand and sing the song that has been selected.